We're going to discuss Norway's place and uh, our options in terms of foreign policy. Some people might think um, it's a big question that we have to answer very, very thoroughly, but I feel safe that uh, we've got this really expert panel that are going to have an easy time uh, in 50 minutes ask, answering these questions. We have uh, Astra, we have Lisa Rockness from uh, uh, University of Bergen and uh, Cecilia Hellestvedt. Let's give all of our panel members a hearty round of applause. Yeah, Asla Toyan, what do you think? Where should Norway be headed uh, with the backdrop of what we've heard? Let's go right to it. First, I have to say that uh, this fantastic panel, uh, I feel like a kind of a fish out of water here. I don't know why you made me first here, but anyway, in Norwegian foreign policy, we have a tendency to uh, talk about change uh, when there's continuity, and we talk about continuity when there is uh, change. We've turned things around. But in Norway, we see changes within all of the axes within Norwegian foreign policy, within four spheres of Norwegian, the transatlantic and the global and the Norwegian. For Norway, we see a trend in the direction that uh, American geopolitical considerations uh, contr in contrast with global considerations <clears throat> in Norway. We need to make sure that uh, the framework is broad enough. Um, when the Taliban visited Norway, uh, that shows that Norway is independent and we have our way of dealing with things. But that's difficult to balance out with uh, foreign policy considerations with China. We see that Norway has become more dependent on Norway than we used to be. Under financing of our own military has made us more uh, dependent upon the military, America being uh, uh, protecting us than ever before. But fortunately, we've got Sweden and Finland as potential uh, NATO members. And of course, we want them there, but Norway has grown accustomed to, to the fact that the Norwegian, uh, sorry, that the Northern flag, uh, when it concerns uh, the defense of the Nordic countries, has been restricted. We now must share this with the Finns and with the Swedes, no, not least, <clears throat> something that the Americans are glad for. For Norway, maybe the most important uh, foreign policy text is Hakkabakr uh, Skugen, uh, is an article, I guess. He writes in the introduction that this is a considerations of international politics, and in that regard, uh, little Norway and tries to convince uh, wolves to stop eating meat. And that is, Norway is trying to make the world a better place. We are working for a better organized world and we try to reduce uh, the use of violence and uh, our opportunities for that have once again become greater. We are in this difficult situation where we're very dependent upon uh, our alliance partner, the USA, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Moscow, um, uh, with regard to the other power, China, uh, compared with American geopolitics. So with Norway, we need a new uh, approach, a uh, new foreign policy approach. That's my um, advice to all of you thinking people. We need to reconsider this now. We have this uh, rosy picture that the world should be like it was in the 1990s. The dangers are greater. Our r r room for maneuver is uh, more limited. We have to simply accept that all, uh, that not everything is in, our, in Norway's best interest with our friends. And we think about uh, base politics, uh, atom, atomic weapons, and these last years have uh, shown that up. We need an overall holistic uh, idea about how the world should be. I'm not saying we should reinvent the wheel, but we need a new um, uh, foreign policy uh, overall view than what we've had in the past. You're describing a situation 
where things are going off like firecrackers around about us. But what, Morton School Group, uh, what do you say, uh, Lisa? He should stop eating. This is a referral to a fairy tale in Norway. He should stop eating meat. So it's difficult to translate the connection there. <clears throat> that was just a side comment. I don't want to take away from my time. But let's go back to foreign policy. I agree with what was said. Uh, things are, in cha are changing. That's true. There are several concepts. Multiplex we've heard about. I think that we are in a multipolar world as well. And this idea of dividing the world into two, we can forget about that. There's a lot, large part of the world doesn't want this uh, uh, bipolar uh, division. They want more uh, cooperation with India and China, China and these other countries. So to press countries into a new Cold War, a bipolar world, that isn't going to happen. So that can be a challenge for Norway, but this can also give us options. The other thing I want to mention that I'm concerned about but I'm also happy about. I think that this green transition, transition to a more uh, renewable energy, is going to go more rapidly than we thought. And this uh, has to do with the geopolitical world. For a hundred years, hundred years we've been, uh, it, uh, who owns the fossil fuels and so on. The thing is, the conflicts that are derived from that, uh, it, it just, it, we're not sure they're going to continue because things have become decentralized and these fields are becoming less important. So every, uh, uh, we have to accelerate the transition to green. Uh, Field. Things you said are going slowly. It has to go much quicker than it has, and that's our job, looking ahead. That is going to be the greatest challenge facing us. There's a third thing. We have been asleep at the switch, and that's been said earlier. We have been asleep at the switch. We have forgotten the world outside of the United States and perhaps Europe and China. We have forgotten about Africa. Uh, what, is, what is Africa to China? In 2050, half of the people in the world are going to be on the African continent. They're going to have the youngest population. We're going to get older. They are going to be younger. That's where the young people are. And uh, we're not talking about people with uh, starving to death. Uh, forget about those images. Uh, we're talking about people who are educated, innovative people who have new thoughts. And that's going to come from this continent that's going to have uh, half the world's population young people. This is where innovation is going to come from in the future. Yeah, the, uh, large, a large number of people, they live in the cities. <clears throat> um, in Nairobi, for example, uh, cities that have their own um, constellations uh, dealing with communications and energy, and they are really working on these areas. We need to dare to be different now. We need to say that we in Norway, we're not a previous col colonial power, but one thing we do have, we have a lot of money, and we have an ambition to be part of the green shift or transition. Yes, okay, so it's going uh, too slowly, so we agree we're going to do our part to make it go faster. So here we have an option. So let us dare to be different. Let's build relationships to countries on our own, build relationships outside of the EU, outside of the United States, do things on our own initiatives that are good for us and good for world order. Uh, there's so much that's good about Norwegian uh, foreign policy. So let's continue with what's good, but let's stop thinking about uh, Africa as a recipient of foreign aid. 
But think about it. This is where innovation is going to be coming from and where we're going to be a part, have a hand in that. I have uh, one more thing to say, but I've been told to wait a little bit. Uh, we need to move on. So it's easy to think that we live in a bipolar world. And, uh, and Lisa says, no, we live in a multipolar world where Norway dares to be different. And we need to make sure we can work with, say, Turkey and India. What do you think, Ivan? Thank you for the invitation, uh, first of all. That was very pleasant to be here. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking in different directions, but that doesn't matter. Let me begin with an illustration to that question that um, we started with. We have an important ally in uh, the Rito, that's Turkey. But perhaps that's more important part of uh, uh, NATO than Sweden and Finland will be overall, that is, in the future. Turkey has uh, doubled their uh, trade with uh, China since 2020. After the attack on Ukraine, they have uh, intensified their um, commerce. They have a, ma a major recipient of Russian military uh, things. They have uh, rocket systems and other kinds of military equipment. Uh, in the short term, they did not participate in sanctioning Russia. <coughs> And they also have not condemned Russia for their attack on Ukraine. At the same time, Russia and Turkey are on each of their own side uh, in the Karabakh conflict. They're on different sides in the Syria conflict. They have different views about the Assad regime. They are on different sides about the civil war in Libya. Russia supports of this um, rebellion there, whereas Turkey are in that uh, United Nations um, uh, supported group. But at the same time, they collaborate in other areas and other spheres without any problem. They have a good dialogue between Erdogan and Putin in many areas. So this is uh, extremely diverse. They deliver drones to Ukraine. That is, of course, been significant for the Ukrainians. And they receive oil and gas from Russia without any problem. So this is a good illustration of something we see more and more of in uh, foreign policy. If you go to India, who is, that was mentioned uh, in the last session, very interesting. The same thing with Turkey. They have not condemned Russia. They have not uh, gone in for sanctions. On the contrary, they uh, trade more with Russia than before. They receive Russian uh, weapons uh, more than Turkey even does. Uh, Russian technology, both in sea and in land, in great quantities. They collaborate. And it's a new type of missile that is the fastest in the world that is being developed in a very close collaboration between India and Russia. And at the same time, however, India also cultivates close relationships with America. They do that with Russia, but they do that in particular with USA, because USA is important in the matter of this border disputes with uh, India and China against China. And they also buy weapons from France and Israel and America. So how can we understand all this? Both India and Turkey, they are riding two horses uh, in an amazing way. The changing uh, relationships, pragmatic uh, approach. Is it uh, unique? No, it's not. Brazil does something of the same. They have, um, they, they change horses when it fits. Morocco and uh, Algeria. We're used to the fact that Algeria was toward the West and, um, but that's changed now. Morocco is now uh, headed more toward uh, Russia because they are afraid of losing support. Algeria is turning toward the West more because uh, they're delivering gas to the Western countries to replace uh, the Soviet gas. So 70% of Italia's gas comes from Algeria. Before the war, before the last war, before the war, it was 30%. So what this means is, that uh, these things are changing and shifting constantly, these loyalties. And we look at countries like India. 
they have a conflict with China. China doesn't have any regular military um, uh, alliances. They don't really care. They can work with countries irregardless of military. They can work with uh, Amman or Amar. And they are negotiating between Iran and Saudi Arabia. They can do that because none of the Western countries have a relationship with Iran that would make this possible. But China can do it. And they are in a situation where they can exploit that uh, uh, advantage diplomatically in an area where the West has withdrawn. So my point in all of this is to say that the Western world has a challenge, a major challenge here, because the surroundings are so uh, faithless or disloyal. It's more like a one-night stand and <laughs> faithlessness uh, and, uh, you know, uh, than we're used to. And this has become common in many places in the world, inclusive uh, NATO countries like Turkey. And this has become commonplace. So this means that we must relate to these um, uh, unfaithful relationships that we haven't been used to. So within our alliance partners, uh, maybe the Republicans, can, they can have a president even like Donald Trump. Who knows what's going to happen? But uh, we have no we choice in the matter. We have to relate to whoever president uh, comes. Maybe Macron isn't going to be president the next time. Maybe Le Pen is going to be that. And we have to have a good relationship with these people, even if we don't like them. That means that we're going to have unstable relationships, both near and far away. But that, that demands an awareness of what is the case, and we have to know how to relate to it. That sounds pretty demanding, actually. We are more dependent on the United States at the same time that we've lost this um, uh, this prominent place that we had in the Nordic places. These other countries are less faithful. So what do we do, Cecilia? I would like to uh, Esther's uh, uh, description about one night stands. I disagree somewhat. I see it's, it's more like a three way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe this is too much for this panel. It's not a one I said, it's a three-way. <laughs> so what do we do? To say three words about the Norwegian uh, commitment outside of NATO and Europe. Norway is present uh, on the land with different kinds of operations and uh, involvement. What do we do with that? because we're no longer talking about uh, the concept, the general concept, but we're talking about specific choices that we have to make uh, for those projects that we are involved in in these countries and the people who are working for us in these projects. Norway has had 30 years of deep peace in the world where we have established ourselves as a humanian major power in that sense. And so in that sense, um, we're bigger than our uh, than what we, you would think we were in concerning um, to go into, um, for example, how we can go into major conflicts and negotiate and bring peace between parties. We've been good at that. We're a, we're a rich country, but we're a small country. We don't have any colonial past, and so we can sell ourselves as, as someone who can negotiate without uh, self-interest. But what our challenge is here is that this world where we uh, operate as a, um, uh, an independent uh, spokesman, I think that's drawing to a close. I think it's been weakened these past few years uh, from 2018 when this geopolitical rivalization between uh, Russia and China and America began to start up. So the question is, what does Norway do in light of this for our uh, political commitment and our foreign aid has uh, in principle been based upon this idea of supporting people who need it, support for societies that need it. And Norway has always been there to help contribute to create a better society. So our challenge now is that all of these activities here they support and strengthen individual structures. 
So when we have foreign aid, we are helping services in countries with in countries where the leaders have their own alliances. So when we have humanitarian conflict, uh, humanitarian aid, it often goes to helping one party. Uh, so it winds up being support for one actor or player that a friend for another. That's the way it works. So Russia and China, they weigh heavier on the scales in areas where we have a finger in many projects in Asia, America, and the Middle East. And I think that agreement that came between Saudi Arabia and Iran recently, uh, China is a guarantor for that. It's Iran and Saudi Arabia that have taken the initiative to this, but it's this dynamic between the two countries that is the background for that. But China has been invited in as a guarantor for that. This means that when we also help um, facilitate things and the Chinese come in and guarantee the result, or you can say exploit the effect of the very, the very good of, uh, that comes from the Norwegian activity and commitment in, uh, in terms of foreign aid, then it winds up serving other people's interests, unfortunately. So Norway has been doing this kind of thing as an independent country and also an, a Norwegian, as an European countries outside the EU, closely allied with the USA. Sometimes we do things that the USA hasn't known or, but in the overall picture, it's uh, served the American interests. That's not the way it is now. Both the Americans and the Chinese and the Russians, they bind the humanitarian help closer to their security and economic interests. So what does Norway do when that happens? Because our neighbors in the South, Africa, the Middle East, Asia in particular, there's a lot of disturbance. There are more conflicts here than ever since the Second World War. And they can escalate, they can increase. Here is where the climate areas, we need to roll out, we need uh, control. Um, there is a population explosion, many things. All of our key interests as a nation are tied up with what happens down there and what does Norway do with its commitment there? Are we going to be neutral and objective third party without any clear cut self-interest and say, well, the, the Americans aren't here, so we're going to be here there. Oh, when the Chinese are here, we're going to be here anyway. Russia's going to be here. Well, we're going to be here anyway. Do we do that? If we say no to that, then we're no longer neutral and objective, and nor can we expect to be perceived as such. So our choice, who are we going to be in this part of Norwegian politics? That's up to us to identify who we intend to be. If we choose to insist to be Norway as an independent player, then we are going to encounter greater political opposition from major countries than we've been used to. But on the other hand, if we choose sides, then we and our project and our people, we are more exposed and vulnerable out there. So it's a very heavy choice for Norway to make, but I do believe that it's high time that we take that, a discussion about that. And Okay, Asla Teb. Which way should we go at this crossroads? It has to be the politicians, as Cecilia, what she says, that's very relevant. That we have a uh, foreign policy tradition. Um, I think uh, Washington also has understood that's important for our alliance. So when people come to visit Norway, Sometimes they, they frown, um, whereas other countries are glad that Norway does the way it does. But when you look at research, small countries like Norway have a tendency to overestimate our, uh, our foreign policy uh, options. And so we uh, make mistakes. So we have an ambitious strategy and then we uh, become panic-stricken 
when it finally emerges how weak we are and how few our, our options are. And then we run off to our Americans and uh, we need to come to, uh, we need to change the room for our foreign policy and become an independent player. That's why I stopped by saying we need to think through these things. I think it's important, necessary, to let intelligent people look at what are our traditions, what are our major doctrines, what are our interests, and set that up against certain basic uh, tenets as to how foreign policy should be carried out in the future. Because we, uh, countries with different governments, red and blue, various, they sometimes have common interests. And you can think, well, the Labour Party has generally had this way of thinking it. What we saw in this Reflex project, which was a, um, a very good description of the situation out in the world, what was lacking, okay, they said, what so? What should Norway do? Um, we, something we didn't do before, but we need to do now. It's difficult. Now, Norway, in this situation where we are more dependent on NATO, that we are going to liberate ourselves from the USA, uh, no, what I'm trying to say, and uh, the, what I was trying to say, we are an ally. We are an ally of Europe and the USA, but the large part of the world isn't. And we need to understand that. And that has its own inbuilt challenges, but it opens up options for us that we haven't utilized enough. We haven't made use of our possibilities, our options. For example, where are our interests? Where can we actually do some good? And to think, with those tools that we have, with those means at our disposal, how can we help bring about a green transition? Look at Africa. Look at Africa as an innovation center. And that's what I want to say about this. We've heard a lot today earlier that has been a danger that the Norway, the debate in Norway is too introspective. And so my thought is, we have a tremendous basis for initiating a wonderful discussion. And we can change our opinion when we listen to other people as needed. We have the universities. And I would ask the government to turn around when it concerns international costs uh, for students that come to Norway. Please change your policy, Sarah. Help finance them better. We need that discussion more than ever before. We need people from outside to come to Norway for education more than ever before. In any case, there's no shame in changing. So it's not time to close the door. We need to be global players here. We have to have a global perspective more than ever before. We need these ideas from outside. And it's not too late to change. Um, I don't have any appeal. But I do want to say one thing. I have even more a desire to say it's a fact that the USA is, accounts to 90% of the help that Ukraine gives. The other countries are uh, nearly insignificant. It's the USA that provides nearly all of the military help. And the, uh, also the same thing about uh, the material aid in NATO. Canada and Great Britain supply most of the rest, as the USA is completely key here. Europe can't defend itself without uh, USA. Norway cannot uh, defend itself without USA. Uh, even in Western Europe, the USA militarily is absolutely crucial. But at the same time, we are in a situation where these uh, unstable situations so where people change shirts at many times, governments are change, and uh, there's a lot of unfaithfulness. Um, countries, depending on the issue as to whether they're loyal to their allies, 
And so the idea being how loyal should we be to the United States. So where we cannot follow the United States, <clears throat> that is when uh, President Bush Jr. that said in 2001 against terror, he said, the ones who are not for us are against us. A little country like Norway can't say that. We must be present where there is somebody that is uh, against us. It's necessary to have a uh, multifarious ad hoc diplomacy. If there's anybody that has shown us some uh, masterly, uh, 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 showed us how masterly this diplomacy can work, that is the president of Ukraine. So to get, so he has been able to support, gain, garner support that is completely uh, unusual, but it's ad hoc. It's without a state, it does not grown out of a stable uh, order. It's been built ad hoc. And that is an approach to a world that is uh, free floating, so to speak. At the same time, as we know that this uh, being anchored in uh, the United States protection is uh, lies firm. And it's also not the case that the United States uh, supports uh, Europe and uh, because they have an obligation, moral obligation. They do it in their own self-interest. In 2013, we see that in, when Crimea was uh, invaded, they didn't do anything. No, nah, that's not in our self-interest. Oh, they had a few sanctions, but they didn't really do much. They said, let's wait and see. And uh, February 2022, they had a different way of looking at it. Oh, we've got to do something. This is our security that's at stake here. And so then they went in there fully. And it's American self-interest that determines as to how much or whether U.S. intervenes. And that's the way it's going to be in the foreseen future, foreseeable future. And America does have uh, major interests in Europe. Is there a big difference between... Uh, between uh, what about the foreign policy situations? Are we masters in diplomacy there? I think we've come to a point where it's difficult to separate uh, foreign policy with other types of policies like uh, foreign aid and green shift and so on. I think it's going to be a little more difficult because these big major actors or players, they want to have more of a say. That doesn't mean that Norway is going to join the flock, so to speak, 100%. But I think when it concerns the key interests that Norway has as a country, we are extremely uh, in tune with America and the European countries, and that is going to continue. I don't think uh, anybody in Norway really uh, denies that. But that doesn't mean that we have to follow uh, America in every single thing. And the question is, what are going to be those topics where we choose and insist on independence and why? And I don't think that we're all just going to take everything that's happened in the last three years and say, oh, we're good at this and good at that. I think that we need to have a more fundamental debate on why is it important for Norway? Because then we will uh, be more inclined to uh, commit ourselves where the cost is there. So the people that we wind up being allies with, um, they, these allies are going to do things that aren't part of the picture that we have in view. And so in those areas, we have to have an open and honest debate about it so that we can agree on what it is that we are willing to prioritize and uh, suffer for. Do you want to comment on that? I just want to support that. We have some challenges that will uh, uh, be there. The Americans are not going to pay for the building up Ukraine after the war. They say we can pay a little, but we're not going to pay for that. Uh, they weren't willing to uh, pay for the expansion of Norway. Uh, they want us to isolate China economically. That has a greater price for the Europeans than it does for the Americans. So how are we going to relate to that <clears throat> when it concerns um, the future of our alliance with America. They have very specific ideas about uh, NATO being a North Atlantic uh, uh, alliance uh, with a specific uh, China politic. I don't see how we can go along with that. These are things that are going to matter for Norway. We need to think through 
what do we do if these things that Americans think uh, wind up coming on our board and uh, we feel pressured and that's such a disadvantage. Um, we're pressed for time, but you had your hand up. When we reach the point when we talk about rebuilding Ukraine, then I think that uh, uh, Norway is going to have an important role to play in the Nordic countries. And I, I look forward to that. And that's correct. So the first thing I want to say about that, that is an option we have to really uh, speed up the, the green transition. Yeah. Again, this is uh, playing on the uh, – uh, they're playing on a Norwegian fairy tale. It's very difficult to translate, so it's joking toward the end here.